So let me forward that. Um, today we're honored to have Marty Frapoli spending some time with us. I'm going to share his impressive bio. So bear with me as I go through that. Uh, so Marty is a risk management and insurance consultant with Longhorn Knowledge Resources. He's headquartered in Austin, Texas. Longhorn offers custom individual and group insurance training, research, writing, and in analytical services. Uh, before that, Marty served 18 years as Senior Director of Knowledge Resources for the Institutes in Malvern, Pennsylvania. His experience there includes the design of educational courses and safeguarding the academic integrity of the in Institute's curriculum. His national presentations and articles include showcases at RIMS, PLRB, IDMA, CAS, Accord, NAPIA, and the CPCU Society. Uh, Marty's areas of specialty include claims, the Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, cyber risk, and data management. He's the author of many institutes courses, some of which include auto claims practices, managing cyber risk, and, and one familiar to many of us, CPCU 530, business law for insurance professionals. Um, before joining the institutes, Marty led the data management group at NJM Insurance. Marty earned his BA at Rutgers University and his master's in organizational leadership at Quinnipiac University. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. That's pretty uh, close. Pretty close, okay. Uh, he was awarded the Fellow in Insurance Data Management designation by the Insurance Data Management Association. So very impressive bio. We're glad to have Marty with us today. In a, a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Marty, but we're gonna do a quick poll before I do that. I think Heather's gonna help me with that. Oh, you should see that on your screen. How do you think it will, how long do you think it'll be before autonomous vehicles represent half of the vehicles sold in America? So go ahead and make your selection there. 15, 20, 25, 30 years, or no way I'm letting a robot drive my car. The votes are rolling in, Ken. All right, let me know when you're, you've got those collected and I'll continue on. We, we promise this isn't a trick question and there won't be a test at the end. All right, you pretty good, Heather? Yep, I think we're good. All right, thank you for uh, participating in that. Um, we've got some results you can see there. It looks like by and large, about half of us, 47%, thought about 20, 20 years or so. So, uh, but we've got a pretty good spread. Interesting results. We may, uh, time permitting, revisit this again at the end of the presentation to see if, if you've been swayed at all. So I'll go ahead and close that. I'm going to stop sharing at this point. And Marty, I'll, I'll turn it over you, to you to get along with your presentation, A Future Without Auto Claims. All right. Well, thank you. Let me see if I can get my screen up there. We got and it. Are you seeing my, my um, PowerPoint? Yep, we got it. OK, great. We're good to go. Well, uh, thank you and thank Heather and thank uh, all of you at uh, Central Illinois Chapter for inviting me here. It seems like a short time ago but when I checked, it was actually 2013 when I had the privilege to be part of your I-Day. And uh, I really enjoyed my, my visit to town uh, and the time I spent with the chapter. And it's a great privilege for me to, to join you again today. So we'll, uh, we'll jump right in here. You can advance the screen. There we go. 
So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we want to look at insurance and technology at both in, in the longer term sense of uh, how it's influenced risk management insurance. And then we'll drill down into some specific technologies and especially, of course, for our, our uh, subject, uh, main purpose, uh, automobile. So we want to understand the mutual benefit uh, for all parties when you can replace pain for losses with loss prevention. And we'll drill down on that autonomous car and short tech. And uh, we also want to look at uh, what insurers need to do in response to these sort of technological changes. For more than 100 years, technology uh, has helped insurers reduce claims. So we'll take a close look today at autonomous cars, where they're, they've been, where we're going. We'll look at features such as Summon from Tesla. And then we're going to try to look at this technology in a larger framework uh, and see what has been happening since at least the 19th century with insurers. It's not a new framework that uh, technology is allowing insurers to prevent losses instead of paying losses. So we'll take a quick look at InsurTech history. And uh, we're asking a question, can we get to zero losses or reasonably try? And so before we look at uh, auto specifically, let's examine some other lines of business um, to get some perspective on how technology, even the kinds now regarded as old fashioned, can be leveraged to reduce losses. In 1865, the worst boiler disaster in history occurred on the steamboat Sultana on the Mississippi River. 1,800 people were killed. It was bad risk management right from the start. That boat was designed for a maximum of 300 passengers, but it was loaded with over 2,000 people, most of whom were Civil War prisoners. And during that steam-powered phase of the Industrial Revolution, steam boilers, and of course, most of them in factories, not on, on boats. Uh, a boiler explosion occurred on average every four days. And most business owners regarded that uh, such accidents as inevitable, simply the price of doing business. Uh, but one year after this terrible accident, the Hartford Steam Boiler and Inspection Company was founded. Inspection and Insurance Company, pardon me. They embraced the principle that financial interests protected by insurance were secondary to safety and loss prevention. And they turned to loss inspections, safety inspections to pursue that end. And a bonus for Hartford, and this is a theme we're gonna see over and over, preventing explosions, preventing accidents is cheaper than paying claims. In 1919, the Hartford facilitated a piping configuration known as the Hartford Loop, also known as the Underwriters Loop. And it had a dramatic effect at further reducing boiler explosions. Hartford was certainly a pioneer in, <coughs> excuse me, in combining safety inspections with insurance. It seems like just common sense. Preventing losses is better than paying losses and not just from the insurer's standpoint. Preventing losses is a win-win. And so now this is a common trend in risk management and insurance. So we'll examine the new tech that is accelerating the shift from risk financing to risk management. And uh, ask the question, will other lines of business leverage new tech to be more like boiler and machinery where losses are rare? Can we see a path for insurers to shift from loss payments to risk management services? And we'll take a deeper look. And before we get to all that, we're gonna to turn to workers' compensation. In Wisconsin, the first US workers' comp law was passed in 1911. Insurers, again, soon realized that preventing accidents is better than paying compensation. The early steps were simple, safety railings, hard hats, protective eyewear. And in addition to insurers working with insureds, the government has a role. But it wasn't until 1970 that we saw the federal law codified under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration better known as OSHA. Employers and insurers have leveraged the Workers' Comp Compact and OSHA to use technology to prevent workplace, workplace accidents. And again, that's a win for the worker, a win for the employer, a win for the insurer. Uh, remember that the purpose of Workers' Comp laws is to protect employers from lawsuits, 
pay for workers' medical costs, cover their lost wages, and facilitate rehabilitation and a return to work. Workers' comp has certainly changed. The type of work has changed from largely dangerous factory jobs to desk jobs. Uh, one of my previous employers was New Jersey Manufacturers Association that was founded to ensure uh, workers' comp for manufacturers. And of course, they're still writing workers' comp, but it's for mostly people in desk jobs now. Uh, insurers, employers, and regulations like OSHA continue to improve worker safety. Workers' comp claim frequency is down about 20% since 2011, although at the same time, severity has ticked up a little. Uh, in general, workers' comp claims are less frequent and less severe due to the nature of work, but workers' comp now covers many things not contemplated in 1911. Examples include repetitive stress claims, emotional distress, and um, sexual harassment claims. Going forward, one key difference in loss prevention is that wearables and other um, Internet of Things, IoT devices, can provide real-time data. And that could be another presentation by itself, and it's not our focus today, so we're just going to leave that there. But the, the bigger point is we've been able to learn from loss data, but now we can predict and prevent accidents in real time. That's a huge shift in what today's technology is enabling. And then that's not just workers' comp. So let's turn to our main focus, automobiles. Uh, on the slide, you can see a quote there, and that's from Jameson Wetmore at Arizona State University. And it's, it's worth covering this in detail. When he says, at every point in the past 50 years, someone mentioned that autonomous vehicles were just 20 years in our future. That's what they said in the 60s, in the 80s, and the late 90s. For the first time in history, driverless cars are not 20 years in the future. They're much closer than that. And I had that quote in mind when I saw the, the opening survey, and I did not have a hand in crafting that survey, because if I did, I would have had more options at the shorter end there, five years, 10 years. Um, and that doesn't mean I necessarily agree with Wetmore here, but it's, it's exciting uh, to think that um, others are, are, are seeing this happening soon. Uh, Elon Musk, we all know, the CEO of Tesla Motors, has said that governments may outlaw humans driving cars due to the danger. Uh, quote, you can't have a person driving a two-ton death machine, end quote. Uh, Robert Melville, he is the chief designer at McLaren. He anticipates a future where cars must operate autonom autonomously, at least in urban areas. Uh, again, for safety reason. And my own feeling is that we may look back on the time of human piloted cars as a time of unimaginable carnage. The way we now look back at Civil War surgeons cutting off limbs on the battlefield with no anesthesia. Uh, but even for those who see a driverless future, the timeline, as the opening survey indicated, is one of the key variables. Some statistics cite, and uh, I won't dispute, that human error is the cause of 95% of all motor vehicle crashes. That's from the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So we'll keep that statistic in mind as we evaluate the promise of features like Summon from Tesla and autonomous features in general. And despite that 95% statistic, a 2020 study by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety reports that only one third of crashes were caused by mistakes that autom automated vehicles would be expected to avoid simply because they have more accurate perception than human drivers and aren't vulnerable to incapacitation. In other words, um, autonomous cars don't drive drunk. To avoid the other two thirds, they would need to be specifically programmed to prioritize safety over speed and convenience. So in other words, human error is a broad category and current autonomous technology helps solve only a third of the human hazard. Let's drill down into the autonomous car technologies. Uh, what makes a vehicle autonomous? The NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, 
uh, specifies five eras of uh, motoring safety. And we see them there on the slide. Uh, most of the cars I drove for my entire life had zero or negligible autonomous features. They had certainly safety features like seatbelts and then convenience features like cruise control, which arguably is or isn't an autonomous feature. And you know, it wasn't uh, until the last 10 or 20 years where we saw any sort of features by which the vehicle could assume control. Certainly since 2016, uh, and a little before then, we see advanced driver assistance, automatic emergency braking system, lane centering assist, cars that can park themselves. And uh, according to NHTSA, they're looking at after 2025 for fully automated features like highway autopilot. So an important point here is that in two, 2020, we don't yet have any fully autonomous vehicles in the sense that even the most advanced car available to the public still requires a human operator to remain engaged. And we're gonna look a little more closely about what it means to be an engaged operator. Uh, this slide ties in with a previous one about levels of automation. The NHTSA timeline we saw relates to the features noted in the levels of autonomy as described by the SAE International. That's the group formerly known as the Society of Automotive Engineers. And again, most cars that are on the road today are level zero or level one, a handful are level two in terms of how much automation they have. And the, the, the key as you work your way up, the more more capacity of what the vehicle can do without human intervention to get to level five is that level five is where the vehicle can perform all functions under any condition the driver may have the option to take control, but isn't um, required to take control. And that is very different from what we're seeing in cars in operation today. Broadly, autonomous features can be classified. This is another way to look at breaking down the features. Uh, two broad categories, those that compensate for driver error and those that take over control from, from the driver. Uh, for trucking, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, IIHS, published a report just this past September, and they try to quantify some of the safety advantages of autonomous features that mitigate human error, like forward collision warning, which they abbreviate FCW, and automatic emergency braking systems, AEB systems. And we see those advertised in car ads on television today. Matt Moore is a senior vice president at the Highway Loss Data Institute. Uh, HLDI, and that's part of the IIHS, and I apologize for all these acronyms, ac acronyms. And he says that for large trucks, FCW and AEB, those two technologies, reduced rear end crashes by 44 and 41 percent, respectively. So uh, those are, they don't take over so much from the driver uh, as they compensate for driver error. So the key question is, as we move forward with autonomous and semi-autonomous cars, when do machines become better operators than humans? When do we cross that line? And we all think we're above average drivers. I, I know my own personal feeling is I want machines to take over for everyone else who's a lousy driver, uh, but I still want to drive my own car. That, that's opinion, and well, let's stick a little more to the facts here. Uh, but with some historical perspective, Elevators were once so dangerous and exotic that they required operators. Uh, today, the risk has been almost entirely engineered out of them. And uh, can we ask, is there any meaningful parallel in the development of autonomous cars uh, and, and vehicle operators to uh, the progress that took place with elevators so many years ago? New cars have around 100 sensors in them and growing. But how effective are crash avoidance and driver assist systems? There are new risks introduced when the driver is supposed to be engaged, but is not. And that ties back to where we looked at those autonomous features and if they require engagement of the driver. So there are two, at least two distinct schools of thought on how we can best get to an autonomous car future. Google, in contrast to Tesla, decided to aim 
not for gradual autonomy, but only for a fully driverless car. They had begun uh, rolling out features gradually. Uh, they were using test drivers for their self-driving features of the you know, Google cars, right? which was really the early ones were modified stock cars, not their own cars. And the drivers they enrolled signed contracts promising to stay engaged, but Google found that they didn't. In one um, notable instance, a driver turned around while driving down the highway at 65 miles per hour to rummage around in the back seat to get his laptop to charge his cell phone uh, where the battery was dying. And the, the main discovery that Google made was that drivers stop paying attention when they don't have to, even though they're supposed to. Uh, another study showed partial autonomy in a car increased their number of off-road glances by 26%. And uh, around that time, this was 2016, Google rebranded its autonomous car division as Waymo. And that's what we see on the slide here. And at that same time, it pivoted from an incremental approach to an all or nothing, fully autonomous level five car. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a little comparison of how uh, some car makers are doing the incremental rollout, whereas Google is, is aiming just for that fully autonomous level five car. We know that Waymo was committed to that all or nothing approach. Uh, the other car makers uh, that we'll talk about, new and traditional, they're incrementally introducing cars with autonomous features. And we could focus on any of them. But let's concentrate on Tesla because uh, certainly it's on the leading edge and it gets the lion's share of the press. Tesla and uh, most conventional automakers are taking that incremental approach to driverless vehicles, rolling out additional autonomous features gradually as consumers grow in understanding how to operate a semi-autonomous car. Perhaps the most publicized accident occurred in 2016 when Joshua Brown died in his Tesla when it broadsided a semi-truck trailer. That Tesla's autopilot features failed in the broad daylight to recognize the side of the trailer. Brown's car struck it at 74 miles per hour. Data collected by his vehicle showed that the car warned him seven times to resume control but he did so long enough each time only to silence the warning. And beyond tragic cases like that, there are plenty of online videos you can do a Google search showing reckless behavior by Tesla owners. Examples include highway activities as well as imprudent applications of Tesla, Tesla's smart summon feature, and we'll drill into what that is later. Uh, it, it enables the vehicle to leave its parking spot, um, say at an airport parking lot, and navigate to the owner. The conundrum to the incremental approach is that as drivers become more comfortable with and dependent on autonomous features, the less capable or engaged they will be when required to resume control. Still, there are advantages to the incremental approach. So we'll take a closer look at the uh, Tesla's summing features. And in doing that, there's one important distinction we need to make. Uh, I don't know how familiar you may be with Tesla, uh, but they have a feature called summon and another feature called smart summon. And it's, it's easy to use these two terms interchangeably, but they do refer to two distinctly different autonomous features of a Tesla. And we're going to uh, examine both of them here. Summon is designed to permit the Tesla to drive a short distance, forward or backward, without a driver behind the wheel. This can be useful, for example, to back a car into a parking space. Consumer Reports says that this feature can work as expected, but not so well in tight spaces, where the Tesla owner's manual advises that a narrow space limits the ability of sensors to accurately detect the location of obstacles increasing the risk of damage to the car or its surroundings. Smart Summon is an expanded capability. According to Tesla, uh, and I quote here, 
Smart Summon is designed to allow your car to drive to you or a location of your choosing, maneuvering around and stopping for objects as necessary. Like Summon, Smart Summon is only intended for use in private lots and driveways. You can stop your car from driving at any time by releasing the button, end quote. Consumer Reports says that the vehicle often performed oddly by taking roundabout routes to its destination, getting stuck on an incline and deactivating, pausing in the wrong lane, rolling past stop signs, and taking wide turns that require a K-turn to correct. Again, it's important to remember Tesla's qualifications, which state that smart summon is only intended for use in private parking lots and driveways. In October of 2019, CNN reported, uh, and I quote here, Smart Summit is a feature that slowly drives Teslas around parking lots and driveways with no human behind the wheel. Owners set a destination within 200 feet on Tesla's app and then hold a finger on the screen for the vehicle to drive to them. The Tesla will stop at its destination or earlier when owners lift their fingers from the screen. Excited Tesla owners have taken to parking lots nationwide to record videos of their cars bundling around like a nervous driver's ed student. There have been fender benders, near crashes, ignored stop signs, painfully slow driving, and at least one police run-in. Some fearful owners have aborted tests mid-drive. Others have tested two Teslas on Smart Summon in the same place, confusing the cars. Consumer Reports has called the feature glitchy. Beyond Summon and Smart Summon, Consumer Reports tested all of the Tesla's autonomous capabilities and concluded that the advanced features don't make the car self-driving and are not worth the extra $8,000 price tag. Uh, and the beta features introduce risk. And, and we saw that before that Google with their Waymo project and decided incremental features introduce risk. There was an article by Gustavo Rufo on an electric vehicle's website and it reports on a social media discussion where a Tesla fan takes a novel approach to defending the safety flaws in Tesla technology. And I will quote, Tesla's quality issues keep emerging as fast as the company is selling cars. That also raises complaints, but a Tesla fan has had enough. In a post at the Tesla owner's Facebook group, he tried to clarify that by claiming Tesla, he tried to clarify that by claiming Tesla does not sell production cars, it sells prototypes. Does that mean all Tesla vehicles are in beta testing, just like autopilot? Weirdly, that hypothesis makes a lot of sense. That's the end of that quote. Ryan Schwartz, uh, is the design consultant at Slalom, says this about the latest Tesla self-driving features, and this is another long quote. Some of them are impressive and will for sure save lives. And this work in the long run will be a major boon for society. And this, uh, but others are clearly in beta stage and will lead to accidents. It may be fine to slowly release regular software this way, but cars are so life and death, this scares me. It's eye-opening, for instance, to see a semi-autonomous feature stop the car at green lights by design because the tech isn't there yet to safely operate like a person would. And the summon feature more resembles the movement of a Roomba than a ballet." End quote. In reading that quote, I keyed in on one phrase, in the long run. I have a lot of confidence in autonomous cars, in the long run. I do have deep concerns about semi-autonomous cars that depend on human input, especially those that allow the human to relax, but stay in this ready to re-engage mode. One major consideration for those with a stake in the liability of autonomous motoring is how to mitigate the risk introduced by semi-autonomous features. This falls squarely on car makers. How closely can a car supervise a driver who does not want to pay attention? 
In the wake of the Joshua Brown incident, Tesla designed a you have three chances feature that disables the autopilot if the driver disregards three consecutive warnings. Insurers too must learn and then manage the risk implications of autonomous features and importantly become influencers or partners in measuring how those features reduce or increase the frequency and severity of accidents. Whether you endorse the Tesla or Waymo approach, it's not a binary choice that the incremental or the fully autonomous only approach will prevail. We're likely to see both types sharing a roadway with older cars without significant autonomous features. Driverless technology is one big change on the horizon. Another key question is, how does that affect the ownership model? And I've been talking about this for a while, but I still think it's one of the less anticipated changes that we may face. Recent history has shown that consumers will make the change, the transition from an ownership mode to a streaming mode when the cost and accessibility become irresistible. Now, bear with me for what might be a bit of a stretch analogy. Uh, not long ago, music and movie consumers would periodically upgrade their media. For instance, if you're old enough, going from vinyl LPs to cassettes to CDs to MP3 files for, for music, but staying in that familiar ownership model. Even with uh, digital music, uh, you still own it if you're buying and collecting MP3s. They rotated from VHS to CDs to DVDs for movies, but still maintained a movie collection. But the ownership model changed dramatically when the proliferation of streaming on demand services, uh, because they are compellingly convenient and affordable. And some statistic on that, in just a five-year span between 2013 and 2018, music consumption in the UK shifted from 92% ownership and that's the sum of CDs, vinyl, and digital downloads to a 66% share for streaming. On October 15 of this year, The Verge reported that Cruise, the self-driving company owned by General Motors, has been approved to test its driverless cars on public roads in California. The company says it plans to, to test vehicles without a human safety driver behind the wheel before the end of 2020. And of course, we're already beyond the end of 2020. And Cruz is the fifth car maker to receive a driverless permit from the California Department of Motor Vehicles, along with Waymo, Neuro, Zooks, and AutoX. And overall, 60 companies have an active permit to test autonomous vehicles with a safety driver in California, end quote. So that's just one more glimpse into the future. Because a sharing and on-demand model will be so much more efficient and affordable than owning a car that is infrequently used, it will become irresistible for many except those who live on a ranch or in a remote area. Uh, city dwellers, uh, many of them have already shifted from ownership to using uh, those car sharing services um, whereby you uh, it's like a car rental, but it's a very short-term rental. You use an app, you get it online. Right now, the car requires a driver, so you, you get yourself to where the car is parked, you unlock it with your phone, use it for what you need, and then you're done with it. And you don't have the expense and the hassle of shopping for a car, buying a car, financing a car, insuring a car, maintaining a car, garaging a car, again, especially in the cities, fueling a car. You just have a car when you need it. And and we're all familiar with operations like Uber, where it's, whereas the, the other type of uh, car sharing more came from a rental model, Uber is just a different version of a livery, a taxi model. But think about those two services. When the car doesn't require a driver, what's the difference? You get your smartphone, the vehicle comes to you, you use it when you need it. It's faster, cheaper, better, more convenient in every way, except you can't keep all the junk that you carry around in your car. It's, it's faster, cheaper, better than the ownership model. 
Um, uh, so much like the automobile replaced the horse, uh, this on-demand transportation model enabled by autonomous motoring, motoring is really positioned to replace the ownership model. So insurers who are planning on how driverless cars will affect their books of private passenger and commercial auto must also consider the demise of individual car ownership. And so if indeed the aspect of driverless cars reduces the incentive for individual ownership beyond the fundamental concept that auto insurance becomes less about liability for human error and more about products liability, what are the insurance implications? Insurers must stay informed of the changes that follow incremental rollouts of autonomous features, but not be distracted from the bigger market shifts that driverless cars will enable. Examine your current book of business and project what it looks like as the technology evolves. Private passenger auto insurers especially need to map a path to a future and to future markets where the cars in service are owned by fleets, not by individuals. And so it's not gonna happen with a snap of the finger. Uh, what could slow the advance of driverless vehicles? Then we'll turn again to Matt Moore, that senior VP at the Highway Loss Data Institute, who says, and I quote, advanced driver assistance systems, ADAS, are the foundation on which autonomous vehicles will be built. From an insurance perspective, the best of those ADAS systems is Front Automatic Emergency Braking, ADV which is associated with a 13% reduction in property damage liability claim frequencies and a 23% reduction in property damage uh, frequencies, pardon me, and 23% in BI frequencies. However, our best estimate is that AEV systems were fitted to only 5% of registered vehicles in 2018. I'd have to say we have a long way to go until we have a lot of automated vehicles on the road we need to temper our expectations about the benefits that autonomous vehicles will deliver. Over 90% of crashes are caused by human error, and many people assume that machines will not make the same errors. That is not a good assumption. While we can be confident that AVs won't drive while drunk, we cannot assume that they won't misjudge what other road users are going to do. We also can't assume that the sensors or AVs will never have impeded visibility or that they will never fail to identify emerging crash critical situations, end quote. Because human error is often cited as a cause for 90% or more of car accidents, the hopeful projection is expressed that autonomous vehicles can eliminate 90% of accidents. However, a 2020 study by the IIHS, and we covered this a little earlier, only a third of the crashes were caused by mistakes that automated vehicles would be expected to avoid simply because they have more accurate perception than human drivers and aren't vulnerable to incapacitation. And here's the key. To avoid the other two thirds, they would need to be specifically programmed to prioritize safety over speed and convenience. The technology for driverless cars draws most of the attention, but equally important is the infrastructure in which autonomous vehicles can succeed. The Harvard Business Review contains a report on the need for building the proper infrastructure, stating that automated systems need to collect, classify, and respond to information. And this is easier to do in a clean, unambiguous environment, which is what many driving environments are not. The designers of self-driving systems simply cannot foresee every possible combination of conditions that will occur on the road, end quote. Much of the early rollout of autonomous vehicles will be in tightly controlled environments, special lanes on highways, retirement villages, private property, and commercial vehicles employed in farming and mining. It may be a long path to developing roadways that can be used safely by a mix of conventional semi-autonomous and fully autonomous cars and trucks. Often overlooked in the promise of driverless technology are the legacy vehicles. 
There are more than 250 million light vehicles operating in the United States. And the average age of these cars is almost 12 years. Even if beginning today, every new car sold was a fully autonomous vehicle, it would take a long time to change the mix. The benefits of autonomous vehicles can't be meaningfully realized until a critical mass is in service. And naturally that ties back to our early question, but I, I noted how uh, smartly it was phrased. It was not vehicles on the road, it's vehicles sold uh, at what point. So even vehicles sold, if much with more than 50%, we still have all those legacy vehicles. And interestingly, the coronavirus may be another factor that uh, has slowed the rollout of autonomous vehicles. Uh, a June 9, uh, 2020 article in Barron's notes that due to sluggish sales, car makers need to preserve cash. Uh, and given the cost of developing driverless technologies, the timeline for fully autonomous cars likely has been delayed by a couple of years. So if indeed the driverless uh, autonomous uh, capability makes a driverless car so, uh, uh, on demand so convenient to us that we move away from the ownership model, it will have impact across broad segments of society. And we're gonna look at some here, you know, this bullet list. Uh, it's not just the car makers and insurers who need to plan ahead. For instance, some uh, police, uh, especially in some municipalities, generate a lot of revenue with uh, traffic violation tickets. Autonomous vehicles, we expect, will obey traffic laws if we even need traffic laws. And so, on one hand, municipalities don't, won't need to pay for traffic enforcement, but they won't collect the, the tax uh, the ticket revenue either. Um, we, we, we've spoken about car makers a little bit, car insurers, car repair shops. Um, and we'll, we'll drill into some of these. What happens to lawyers, home builders? Um, might ask yourself, well, what does autonomous cars have to do with home builders? We'll talk about that, urban planners uh, and, and other areas. One big one is the medical costs. Uh, right now, auto accidents are the number two lethal accident in the United States. And if autonomous motoring proceeds as uh, expected, it could drop to number nine by the year 2050. And with advancing technology, car accidents should become as rare as subway accidents. Uh, right now, 2.5 million Americans per year visit the emergency room after auto accidents. The cost of auto accidents in the United States alone is over 200 billion a year. So we can save billions of dollars, not to mention, more importantly, the health and productivity of those who otherwise would be injured in an auto accident. So let's little, dig a little deeper into uh, insurance implication. What is car insurance for? What is its purpose? Largely, it's about protection from human error. But in the future, that liability shifts away from the operator to the manufacturer. And again, we've heard estimates about the number of vehicles going away. There are also estimates that 90% of the cars will go away. Again, if we're in this streaming model, where we don't each own a vehicle that's sitting in our driveway or our company parking lot or the supermarket lot. Um, if cars will be in continuous use on demand by uh, drivers anywhere. The total number of cars will drop dramatically. What's interesting is that doesn't mean the total miles driven drops, maybe even goes up. But a car that now lasts an average of 12 years might last an average of 12 months or less because it will get so much use. So with that in mind, um, I would encourage all of you to Google and find uh, Randy Maniloff, M-A-N-I-L-O-F-F, -F, who writes an excellent free online journal called Coverage Opinions. He's a partner with White and Williams in Philadelphia. So if you just Google Coverage Opinions, White and Williams, you'll find it if you're having trouble spelling his last name. But he's a really smart analyst uh, in this area. And he says, and I quote, adoption of self-driving automobiles will dramatically alter the landscape for lawsuits following car crashes and the insurance policies that fund the verdicts and settlements. 
Accidents that are now simply and quickly resolved will become complex, drawn out technological fights between drivers and manufacturers over liability. Car crashes will go from one of the law's simpler problems to complex product liability litigation. This is the plaintiff's lawyer's dream, a deep pocket for every automobile accident. And I agree with Randy that that is certainly likely for the intermediate term. Uh, I personally am optimistic that the autonomous technology will eventually take accidents so far down that yes, car crashes will be complex litigation, but they will be very rare. And if we get to that point and accidents go away, then premiums, the exposure goes away, the premiums go away. And how do insurers respond to that? Again, eliminating human operators offers the potential to eliminate 90 to 95% of accidents. And certainly the imperfections in telematics and driverless technology will cause some accidents. But advances, uh, the advances in sensors and real-time data sharing that we referenced earlier with workers' comp will also apply in automobiles um, that can reduce machine-caused accidents as well. So imagine a future of better maintained fleet-owned autonomous cars that we summon as we need them. And eventually 95% of auto accidents are eliminated. What happens to auto insurers? There was a Bloomberg article in uh, February, 2019, two years ago. And it asked, if nobody's driving, why do we need auto insurance? Taking the driver out of the equation is going to mean big changes for insurers. Now we need to keep in mind that there will be an extended period of time when driverless cars share the road with human piloted cars as horses and buggies once shared the road with the, the first automobiles. But with these expensive sensors on cars, repairs will cost more, again, in the short term, partially offsetting cost savings from reductions in the frequency of accidents. And with the constant connectivity that is needed for the important data sharing, cyber risk grows. And insurers might ask, will cyber exposure growth offset the loss of human error exposures? And of course, cyber is not limited to automobile. Um, right now, rating car insurance is largely based on the driver. And in the future, before it becomes simply product liability, rating becomes complicated because it will be more based on the vehicle. And it may take decades but the current premium base for auto insurers may drop by 90% or more. How can insurers respond? How can they prepare? Uh, just like social media platforms depend on data collection. So if you look at Facebook, for example, uh, you're a Facebook member, you're probably not paying them anything. How are they making money? Yeah, they sell ads, but their biggest revenue generator is the value of the data they're sucking from you and all the other members. Uh, so just like social media platforms, a key revenue source may be the data generated from sensors. And Google and Waze and uh, a, a lot of these organizations engaged in telematics and autonomous operation and GPS navigation have already collected a treasure trove of data about vehicles, vehicle owners, how they operate, when they operate, where they're going. And insurers are already looking to partner with automakers in that regard. So a little more about how insurers may respond. Uh, this slide shows the 10 year insurance employment outlook uh, starting a few years ago and uh, up through five years from now. And uh, the biggest and fastest growth areas that we see are specialists whose skills are needed more for risk management than for loss compensation. Advances in technology, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, enable the insurance industry to reduce staffing by increased efficiencies. And um, note that even with projections of double digit reductions in the uh, legacy insurance functions like underwriting and claims, they will still be the largest portion of overall insurance employment. They may have reduced outlooks, but they're not going away soon. Uh, another factor 
Over $10 billion has already been invested in SureTech just since 2012, and that number grows every day. And that reinforces a trend uh, that's focused on automation and analytics-driven efficiencies. My takeaway from, from this is that the insurance industry has already begun the shift to a greater emphasis on risk management services. This is one of my favorite models. And uh, I, was, I was first made aware of this by uh, Mike Elliott, uh, who I worked with at the Institutes. And, and he's quite a, actually, if you've taken the data analytics course, you know Mike, because he put that together. Um, but this talks about the, the knowledge domains and it's based on something that Drew Conway developed um, in, er, in the early analysis on the emerging importance of data science. And in Conway's model, the data scientists lived at the intersection of what he called hacking skills and math and statistic knowledge and then substantive expertise, expertise, in other words, business knowledge. And if we were to translate that for the insurance arena, in these three uh, knowledge domains, uh, the three that would apply are the data and IT skill set, the math and statistics skill set, and uh, the business knowledge, or specifically insurance and risk management. And traditionally, the actuary was the insurance professional who had both the math skills and the business knowledge. And those overlapping areas of expertise are, are well suited to the traditional actuarial roles of maintaining loss reserves and projecting loss costs uh, used for developing rates based on historical data, always looking backwards because that was the nature of data. And as the volume of information expanded, the insurance data manager was elevated from a backroom operator into a new profession. And I got a little passion here because before I worked at the institutes, I spent my career as insurance data manager in its formative days. Uh, the data manager has that business knowledge and the ability to relate to and understand to and talk to the IT staff. And that became an essential link to, link to providing the actuary with actionable data. And so today, all this has come forward and we have an influx of new types of data, big data, and real-time data flowing from sources like autonomous cars. And so the most valuable data scientists and actuaries have that they live right at the very center uh, of these three domains. They have the math and statistical skills, they have the IT and the data skills, and the risk management and insurance knowledge. And as new plan, if you look at the companies who are stealing your business, they have those data scientists that live in, at that intersection. And as new players enter both the autonomous car market and the involving insurance markets for these vehicles, the need for data analytics will drive the demand for actuaries, data managers, and data scientists. You may know Rob Galbraith. Uh, he is the uh, man who wrote The End of Insurance as We Know It, the Director of Innovation at AF Group. And according to Rob, I quote him here, traditional approaches focus on proxy variables that are highly correlated with exposures in aggregate captured at discrete points in time, primarily policy inception and renewal. And I'll just say that harkens back to traditional data capture where we're looking backwards. Uh, by contrast, in an IoT world, Internet of Things plus connected cars, it presents real-time systems that provide feedback on actual behavior that can determine loss, such as driving a car or monitoring water flow. 99.999% of the data in an IoT world is virtually meaningless, but the 0.0001% is highly significant, either because it is a near miss or results in an actual loss. How carriers quote, price, underwrite, adjust, and reserve is all completely different in this new IoT world. Few, if any, carriers are well positioned today to make the leap, end quote. And uh, I always listen carefully for those sort of projections and analysis from Ron. And you probably know that insurers are the 
um, are more hidebound than almost any other industry, slow to change. Insurers have been protected. The barriers to entry uh, of regulation and the capitalization requirements have allowed insurers to change very little and very slowly. From the beginning, the success or failure of insurers has depended on how they use the available data. If modern insurance organizations, legacy players or new, or new entrants are taking full advantage of data to predict losses and find market niches, the smarter and mid-sized insurers could quickly become non-competitive. So early on in this presentation, we saw how workers' comp has evolved from an emphasis on post-loss compensation to loss prevention. It serves the interest of every party. With incentive to drive down costs, the insurer becomes a surrogate risk manager, leading the way in safety measures to prevent losses. The timeline remains in question, but auto risk seems to be on the same path that we saw in workers' comp and boiler and machinery. People and organizations turn to insurers to transfer risk, but the presence of coverage incentivizes risk management activity for all parties. The strength of information flowing from connected cars and the IoT is the provision of accurate data on the go, and it drives the risk management and insurance mindset by rewarding mitigation. Beyond the effect on the risk reward process, new data streams contribute to pricing risk accurately and reducing losses, which in turn makes insurance more available. The key question for insurers, if today's insurance buyer becomes the future buyer of loss avoidance counseling and devices, who makes that market? The good news is insure tech's potential to avoid the human cost and economic damage from auto, worker, and property damage accidents. The question for insurers is how to cope with shrinking exposures. Again, we asked, will the growth in cyber exposures offset exposures eliminated elsewhere? I would say it won't. And I also think insurers are gonna get out in front of cyber risk. Uh, if you roll the clock back just 100 or 200 years, fire was considered a risk that was too wild, too volatile and too, too prone to catastrophe to be insurable. But good practices in hygiene, don't store the oily rags by the boiler, uh, build fireproof um, buildings, personal and commercial, fire extinguishers, safety drills. All of that has made fire a very manageable risk and I think we can get there with cyber risk. Uh, Kevin Pallett is the Managing Director of Aspen Risk Management and he has a pragmatic near-term view and he advises, and I quote, Brokers and insurers must continue their transition from price competitors to proactive and trusted advisors who can show the true value of what they can offer. Insurance should be only part of the solution with risk management being the key issue that actually needs to be addressed by businesses. Ensuring customers understand that strong risk management must become part of their DNA is one of the vital building blocks for success and should be the new normal, end quote. Successful businesses must navigate these complicated transitions. Insurers are naturally in the risk management business, but now more than ever, insurers need a holistic enterprise-wide strategic risk management program for their own business. Insurers must get address game-changing technologies and new competition from non-traditional sources with a holistic framework to manage the downside of those disruptive risks while seeking to capitalize on emerging opportunities. Do you remember Polaroid and Kodak, the film companies that failed to mount a meaningful reaction to digital photography? Consider also the major computer companies in the 60s and 70s. IBM, Burroughs, Univac, NCR, Controlled Data Corporation, Digital Equipment Corporation, and Honeywell. Those that clung to the basic market of computer hardware are gone or diminished. The big survivor, IBM, prospered because it transitioned with marketplace realities as it evolved from a hardware supplier 
to a software company, to a services company. How can auto insurers be more like IBM and less like Polaroid? Uh, Deloitte's got some advice and it's on the slide here. Um, there's a risk management approach, map the implications, have a system, make sure the C-suite is engaged, have an action plan, an oversight committee, and that sounds a little technical and bureaucratic, but uh, the point is if there isn't buy-in across the organization, it's really just window dressing. And computer simulated models can help test the strength of, of these sort of scenarios. The point, the bigger point is to anticipate the future and plan for it to be the IBM, not the Univac or the Polaroid. So uh, our title uh, teased out the notion of zero auto claims. And if features such as that we see in Tesla and Summon and others can move us towards a future of zero auto claims. We certainly know the long-term trend, auto, any line of business is a shift from loss compensation to risk management and loss prevention. InsureTech is accelerating the pace of this change. And InsureTech isn't just what we're doing today. Um, what Hartford did for steam boilers 100 years ago was InsureTech for that era. Uh, but now the data from IoT devices on autonomous cars is a key driver. New exposures like cyber risk continue to emerge. Technology cannot eliminate earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, or every vehicle accident yet. Zero claims may not be realistic, but near zero is possible with automobiles. Again, timing's a, a question on that. And we've talked about the hurdles on the way to eliminating human and machine error in motoring. Savvy insurers need to get ahead of the shift toward an even more risk management services as exposure shrink. Labor statistics confirm that insurers are already doing this on some scale. And while the barriers to entry are high, insure tech players have been partnering with some legacy insurers and disrupting specific markets. And this is a trend likely to continue. You may recall not too many years ago, an advertising theme tried to resurrect sales of a GM brand with the tagline, it's not your father's Oldsmobile. Well, Oldsmobile joins Polaroid and Univac on the scrap heap of American industrial history. Insurers who don't want to join them need a roadmap to the future of autonomous cars without individual owners. And so that is the conclusion of the presentation part of this. Uh, with the time we have left, um, if we have time left, I'm happy to entertain uh, any questions you might have. Yeah, Marty, uh, actually we're, we're out of time. I uh, went a little bit long today, but um, on behalf of our chapter, I wanna thank you uh, for the time you spent with us. I know this is very informative. I learned a lot today and we had a lot of great conversation going on in the chat window. Um, I'd encourage anybody, if you have any questions, uh, if you'd reach out to me and I can get those to Marty to maybe we can respond back through email. Um, we can do it that way. Also, I'd be happy, my email address is on the screen there. You can reach out directly, but um, there might be some value in doing it through the chapter. So we all get to see what those questions are and the answers, happy to share them as broadly as possible. Yeah, great suggestion. Uh, we have that as an option as well. Um, some other things I wanted to share with you guys, but uh, what we'll do is we'll send out a communication with some more details about some upcoming events and other things to be thinking about. So just want to thank everybody for the time today. And thank you again, Marty. And we will see everybody very soon. Have a great rest of the day, rest of the week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.